And I did go through what well, last for, year. <laughs> thanks for coming to today's uh, yeah. Bruce Brown Bag. You all know me. I'm Mark Redford. I'm going to tell you a little bit of, about some of the other things we've got going on uh, in the week to follow and then introduce our speaker for the day. Um, there is a public lecture on, on um, let's see, I want to say on uh, Thursday uh, that has to do with a, uh, a woman who does medical work with the um, uh, with reindeer herders in Mongolia. And so this is something that Center for East Asian Studies is putting on, uh, and we're sort of publicizing it as well. That's 4 to 5 p.m. in Alderson Auditorium in the Kansas Union. Uh, and then on Friday uh, evening, we're doing our uh, um, Friday night at the Kino. And so we've got something, uh, a film set in uh, the Balkans during the, uh, the wars in the 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to be from 7 to 9 p.m. And, uh, here in Bailey. Uh, the film is called Kruguli. Uh, and then uh, next week I want to let you know that we've got the Bacchus Lecture uh, that is coming up. Uh, that's going to be 7 o'clock on Monday evening. Uh, and we've, uh, we've brought in someone who's going to be speaking about English-speaking witnesses to a Soviet war crime, uh, the Katyn Massacre in the words of the POWs, uh, the POWs rather. Uh, and this is uh, Christina uh, Kiyokowska, who is uh, the author of English-speaking witnesses to Katyn at 7 p.m. It's going to be in the Pine Room, not in the... Um, the Malat room, which we usually use, uh, but it should work, uh, and that's in the Kansas City. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Gwen Borlico, who is in history, a PhD student, uh, a friend of mine from, from way back when we uh, both got our Reese MAs yeah. uh, here, uh, and we're living in the Russian house. Um, she came oh, in. Uh, she came in and, and told me uh, sort of the story of her latest research venture, uh, how it got started, and what it involved, and it, it really sounds like a detective novel. So uh, I'm very happy to have her come in and uh, share uh, you know, the story of her research for us. All right. Well, um, I guess first of all, I uh, there was a kind of a pre-presentation question uh, that Professor Alexander asked me, like, how did I find it? And I said, well, I would have to give credit to Professor Levin because she actually introduced me to the manuscript. Uh, once I returned from the uh, Medieval Slavic Summer Institute um, that I attended in 2003, the summer of 2003, I was looking for a project. Um, I needed a project for a research seminar. And uh, Eve came by and she said, well, why don't we look at some of the manuscripts at Spencer? They might work, and, uh, and it would also increase or continue your uh, study of Old Church Slavonic and keep you kind of fresh in that, uh, your use and the skills that you've acquired over the summer. So I said, great, yeah, let's, let's go do it. And uh, so we went to uh, Spencer and we found this manuscript that you see pictured up here. Um, it's actually about, this, about that size, it's about a four by six, if you actually look at it. Um, and, and, and it's, and it's uh, full of 448 pages, um, or 224 folio. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's actually quite complete, but there's many interesting things that um, I found along the way. Um, and, just, and, and just for some informational purposes and a little bit of a plug for uh, the Medieval Slavic Summer Institute um, at Ohio State is that they actually are conducting a, another one this summer and, uh, and it's a great opportunity for students to go and study uh, Old Church Slavonic and paleography. Uh, when I was there, I had the chance to work with Professor Collins, uh, Professor Daniel Collins, uh, and also uh, Predrag Matej, the curator at Hillander, who guided us through paleography and watermark dating, and where Professor Collins really um, worked, helped us work on the close readings of manuscripts and the orthography. So those are the three areas that I really uh, I guess employed in my research of this manuscript. All right, so back to the subject of this talk. Um, the manuscript collection at Spencer Research Library at the University of Kansas isn't generally recognized as a repository for church Slavonic books. Um, however, um, a small number of Cyrillic manuscripts do exist. As I mentioned, Eve has cataloged uh, many of those. And one such manuscript is MS A22. Um, if you go to the, the, the catalog, the online catalog at Katie Library, you have, it's a left-hand 
cita is some type of citation. It's it's weird. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to. It's actually hard to to find it. But um, MSA 22 um, over in Spencer. Um, if you want to go and take a, a look at it yourselves, but you should know it, it is mine. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's my manuscript. It's I, 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 yeah. <laughs> make that clear. Um, so it's a small leather-bound book, as I've mentioned, and it's uh, written in a uh, skilled semi-unsealed or Polostov scribal hand. Um, it was initially identified as a Russian prayer book um, um, in Church Slavic by library catalogers sometime in the 1950s uh, when KU first acquired the manuscript. Um, the acquisition of the manuscript is really a mystery. Um, since going to Spencer, um, I tried to basically find out where it came from, who may have brought it to KU, um, and how we attained it. But all I had uh, was a small blue uh, card catalog, um, and, and the blue significant, as I'll explain, that stated that it was a Russian prayer book, um, and its likely uh, author was the Russian Orthodox Church. And that was, that was it. And I said, well, what does this tell us? And like, we don't know. And, and so what it was is the, the blue card, um, they t explained to me, indicated it was from sometime in the 1940s or 1950s. Um, that's what they understood of it. When they went back and did further research, they have no idea. Um, and going through um, and consulting with Eve, even the personal papers of um, Oswald Bacchus make no, uh, note of this. Um, it could have been obtained uh, through many things. They, they said it could have been obtained in an auction. Somebody could have donated it. They really don't know. Ozzy brought back bunches of books that he got kind of on the left mm -hmm. uh, from various uh, monastery collections mm -hmm. uh, up in the, uh, uh, up in the Bal Baltic, but in other areas as well. And those would never have been attributed mm -hmm. as Stolen by Ozzy back <laughs> right, yeah. in such and such monastery. Uh -huh. So I'm guessing that that's probably, uh, Brad and I talked about this a lot, and, and mm -hmm. not this manuscript particularly, but about some of these acquisitions. So it might very well have been part of what we call uh, the Bacchus load. Mm -hmm. it, it's quite possible. I went through all the he, boxes of his papers. He, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't have mentioned and there was. You know, even looking like in letters for some sort of mention. He went himself. He and went in person. It's not, it's not in there. It's not documented, but he yeah. went in person and traveled. He brought them back in his luggage. Yeah. 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 And, and, and these are things that, um, if a little bit tighter record keeping yeah. or just annotation at the library in the early days would have happened, and then we would maybe have a clearer picture. Um, but uh, that's where we're at at this point. They did say I could look at auction records that, you know, for the past 70 some years, but I declined <laughs> to, to do that. Um, I was like, I, I can't, I can't. Although, um, I, so, I, so I went about uh, basically um, determining, you know, is this a Russian prayer book? Uh, when I first opened it, I, I saw it and I said, Something tells me, it was just a feeling like, this isn't Russian. There's, there's something, and it, it, I'm, I would say that at that point I was a complete novice and probably still am um, at looking at uh, this orthography and um, um, as well as the paleography. But I, from my training at, um, at the Medieval Slavic Summer Institute, I knew that there was something that was um, not, it, it just didn't look Russian to me, so I had to I had to uh, determine its dating, its recension, and the contents um, that you know, and, and how it was actually used is basically the uh, the direction I went. So um, it looked on first um, it looked like a miscellany of texts compiled for individual use by clergy, um, either a parish priest or or a hierarch monk at a Russian monastery. Um, since the manuscript contained liturgical service and specifically services of the Holy Sacrament of Holy Unction, um, the manuscript was clearly designed for a priest's use rather than a lay person for spiritual edification. But as I looked at the manuscript closer, um, actually I found that um, it, was, it was really something different. Um, and so at, 
I'm trying not to jump ahead of, of, of myself, but so the Slavic manuscript, um, what I didn't think it uh, was as a, a Russian manuscript, I went ahead and I took some photos of it and then sent it to uh, Predrag Matej and, and was able to take some watermark photographs of it as well. Um, and this is where I see, if you can see, it's a little bit um, right here. You can see there's a watermark at the top of the page, right? And so these, and, and where, what it looks like here, so here we come down here, here's an anchor with these, these two like spade type of things, hmm. and then a circle. Right? Um, and that, that appears on many pages. Um, in addition to that, um, there's a star marking. Um, and I think that's a little clearer. So you see the star marking as well, which is, is actually part of, uh, of, of the, the original watermark back here. Right? It's part of, of this. Just for someone who mm -hmm. doesn't study manuscripts, what exactly entails a watermark? Oh, what okay. Sure. Well, uh, well, a watermark is basically made when the paper's made. So when the paper pulp is uh, basically mashed up and put onto a large screen. Part of that screen has a, uh, a mark on it. Could be like a, the star, the circle, the, you know, could be a bull's head, we'll see that later. And then the paper is basically pushed over it, dried out, and then it leaves this mark on it. Um, so much like modern day, you know, well, all our watermarks are digital, right? So, but in the same sense that there's a watermark left on it, and it tells you the printer. The who, who basically, or the, it's the, printer, the who made the paper, um, and that's there's there's many watermark catalogs, and I'll reference one um, or two of them here. Um, but good, thank you, all. So, uh, so that's one of the stars, and, and then down here you can also see a countermark. Here's a little C here on the countermark um, that is also associated with that specific. Watermark that I sent off for um, Hillander to take a look at. So the one I'm looking at, and 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 Fred Rod helped me identify, is this right here. And this would be the countermark. So we only have half of it, and some of this, right? So this is part of the the, the watermarking that was left um, that we can identify it. And if you see down here, it's very small. Right here, it's 1560 to 1580. And uh, one of the things is that it, 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 because of this specific watermark, it was not common, why you can date it to, this, to these dates. Um, so we look at, at, the, at this, and it basically gives us a, a basic dating. So another, and this is a, a little bit more difficult to see, is a bull's head, which also, as, as far as dating the manuscript, helps us look at it. You can see an eye here, an eye here, kind of a head, a little nose. Um, and then the next one is a horn, and they're kind of upside down. You can see this horn here, and it kind of comes here. So, again, this is what we're looking at, is something that could be much like this. Um, they were, again, this is where a lot of times the folios were um, quartered or halved, or halved, quartered, and even made down into eighths or sixteenths, and that's why we get partial watermarks. So something that looks a, about like this, or this, um, is what, what uh, uh, um, Liga Child's watermarks, is what we're basically looking at. Okay, we'll go on to that in a second. Um, so the watermark dating, um, basically, it gave me the idea that the manuscripts dated somewhere between 1560 and 1590, um, with the different prominent watermarks that can basically corroborate. What, what, uh, what we do know is, or at least watermark daters, uh, those who are experts in the field, and Predrock Matej is one of them, uh, is that you need at least two watermarks to kind of verify that, that dating. And I was able to, to find uh, two in this case. Um, the watermark evidence does make a strong argument for the dating of the manuscript, the mid-16th century. But I basically, I, I looked at additional textual evidence and, um, in the form of orthographic recension as well as paleographic features to corroborate the dating of the manuscript and to provide a regional uh, location of its production. 
So looking at the orthographic recension, I determined it to be uh, South Slav um, in origin um, a, of a Serbian later Resava recension. Uh, Resavian orthography um, was basically, and its influence was at the Slav, was at the Resava school in the Manasia uh, monastery in, in the, uh, basically in, if you want to say, it, it's always, of course there were no borders um, it, uh, at this time, but when you look at the, the, the location, it could be in western Macedonia, eastern Serbia, um, or, well, who would they say? The Bulgarians would say western Bulgaria, not necessarily <laughs> Macedonia, and, um, and then the Serbians are saying, oh, this is part of it. So it's like these this constant contesting claims about whose uh, location this came out of, uh, not necessarily for this manuscript, but overall. Uh, so what I looked in the orthography, and, and I'll go through a little bit of this, but not uh, you know, in detail unless you have specific questions over it. Again, I'm not, I'm a historian, not a linguist, but I have a little bit of training to be dangerous, right? So <laughs> the, um, but, but with basically what um, I, I contend or I find that there's key features of rest of it orthography um, that can kind of uh, assist us in narrowing the geographic uh, location and applying several diagnostics to the, the manuscript um, I'm going to first, let's see, oops, skip a piece. Uh, I'll first look at this, um, the, the ending of the, the se, ye, um, where it would be written um, normally if, if it was an Eastern Slav, um, would be with this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, Mali use, or this uh, basically what we understand as being the ya. Um, and so we have, what we see here is an ending in uh, a serie, um, and as opposed to that. And it's also consistently that way. Yes, and, right, and it, it is, and you, and you see, find that consistently that the ending has changed. And you can see this, and again, it's, um, and then you can see it also here, you see this serie in the reflexive, and it's not only in the reflexive, but also um, here when you look at for any of the the endings written written in this this way. So this is one of the indicators that I basically contend that shows us that this is a of a South Slavic uh, rather than a Eastern Slavic origin. Um, there's also I don't, I'm not sure if I I didn't include it. But I'll also mention that there is also uh, an absence of, uh, again, the Mali use, uh, the Bolshoi use, um, and, and something that continued in Bulgarian to the beginning of the 20th century, but we don't find it in the manuscript. Um, as far as, let's see, as a comparison, when I looked at, again, at the Okra National Library, I didn't go there, uh, this was something that was uh, online that I was able to access, is the, this, you see the same, the same endings um, consistently throughout this manuscript that found at Okra National Library in Macedonia. And I was a little ahead of myself, but this is the Slavic nasal vowels, the front and the back, the Mali use, what I was mentioning before, and and the and the and the large use, um, which is here, is something that you just do not find at all in the text. So those are some of the indicators um, that make me believe that it's South Slav. When we look at then an additional uh, way of looking at the the manuscript is looking at its paleographic features, um, which uh, are 15th 16th century Cyrillic. Um, and one, one of the ways that you can look at this is looking at the specific letter formations, uh, much like um, Cherepnian did in his classic study of Slavic and Russian paleography. There are several paleographic diagnostics that can be applied to um, the, I, I, can, I, I looked at the letters de, je, ze, and shcha, and, and, and it's like a shta, but um, that's 
So right here. So when we look at these, we can look at the different formations of these letters, and it also dates. Just one example would be the, the shtu right here, this long kind of rake-like tail um, indicates that it is from the 15th to 16th century. You can also look at the the de here that has this kind of like what Professor Collins called the Fu Manchu mustache. Um, <laughs> and that also gives us uh, ideas around when this is dated. Again, um, is there anything else? Oh, the, the Z is kind of interesting. This right here, this flat top Z or Z here, this also gives us an, an indication of the dating. And then I went on and I compared it to um, so an online collection um, that George Mitrevsky um, uh, and a, uh, an assistant professor at Auburn University has put manu Macedonian manuscripts online. So that was one of the, the comparisons I looked at and that was one of the pieces that we saw earlier on the slide. But when I looked at the ones that particularly matched up, the location that I found them all located is Okra down here. Let's see. Here's Macedonia. So here's Serbia. So, anyhow, so we look at Okrid right here, and another location um, uh, and I, uh, was over here in the same area, and, the, and then another location was basically right here. They're small towns that have changed names and, and so on, but this was the basic location of each of the uh, manuscripts that really matched as far as their uh, orthography as well as their paleography. So these are the reasons why I looked at those specific texts and wanted to show that, uh, or was able to show that, that Western Macedonia near the Serbian border is likely um, the place of their production. So the preponderance of evidence um, based on watermark dating, orthography, and paleographic features, as well as a comparison with similar texts in the Balkans region, indicate that MSA 22 is not a prayer book as cataloged at Spencer Research Library, but a mid-16th century slujetnik, or a pre-service book of Serbian recension, most likely from the Macedonian region. Um, and why, the, why is this important? I didn't even realize myself why this was important until I asked, uh, basically, uh, Predrog, uh, and uh, he, he was like, well, do you realize that there are hundreds of thousands of East, Ger East Slavic manuscripts from this period, but only uh, really several hundred thousand um, from the South Slav region. So this is really remarkable that it's even in North America, and that you found a full manuscript that's, uh, that really nobody even knew about, um, that it existed. So he was saying, you know, this is really a big find, and as soon as you publish something on this, the Bulgarians will be coming. Um, so, <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, so um, that's. I mean, it, it, one, it was like I was, I was, I was, ma I was amazed. I was like, really, wow, this is really. And they're like, no, this is this. You know, to uh, Slavic paleographers uh, studying uh, early uh, works and so on. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty big deal, and it's a pretty big deal to me um, as well. So when I, but, but let's get down to some of the more practical uses of it, which is also fascinating, because it's hard to look at and say, you know, how did this, how was, it, how was this book used? And it's hard to kind of draw that stuff out. Um, but what, um, what I did find is, uh, is that, that, you know, basically looking at some of the text, um, there, you, I, the text appears to be reordered, and that there were several different scribes that actually took part in, in uh, making this. Um, there's a comparison, and again, I went through this with uh, Professor Collins. Uh, I was able to go out on a trip last January to um, Ohio State and do this. And so we were looking at it, and, and, and although the scripts are close, they are not uh, identical, and they probably came out of the same scriptorium. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I went through a collection of Slavic manuscripts um, at Hillander and basically was able to say, no, uh, you know, this book, and with Predrag's help, is the, looking at the choir marks, which, this is a choir mark down here. See this right here, this is, and this basically means number 10, page number 10. 
the choir marks weren't lined up as they should be. Um, in addition to the, uh, uh, the, what we would call the Lives of the Saints, um, the church calendar was at the beginning where you would normally find it at the end. So in these cases, you know, the, the, the manuscript was, uh, looked like it was definitely reordered. Um, although the, the, the binding and the cover also, I mean, pretty much, I can't, I don't, didn't do like carbon dating or anything like that, but the, many people have suggested that, however, and I was like, how am I, what? Anyhow, um, but the, uh, so the, man, the, the cover of the manuscript does significant, it dates to the 16th century, but I believe that it was actually reordered and repurposed um, for something else based on the marginalia that we find in here. So we have uh, these uh, folio um, that actually have written things like 1795. Um, and in, in the marginalia, there's other, let's see if I have some other ones. And then we also have another 1795 up here. Let's see if there's another one. No. Um, and so we have these, there's another reference to 1793. But, but moreover, um, what, what, has, what has, you know, like appeared is that this particular manuscript was actually used um, by someone, and if you look at the translate, I did a, a translation of this marginalia, or the, the best I, I could with the help of uh, Professor Collins and, uh, and Predrug uh, back at OSU. And basically on these pages, uh, it, they, they make reference to um, the name of a, a pope, which implies a parish priest other than broth, which would refer to a monk. Um, and the inscriptions throughout the manuscript appear to be in a similar cursive hand, but not all the same. So you can't, yeah, and you can see right down here where you see the pulp. Um, and, and then this, this piece right here, um, I basically, it's saying this book belongs to Father Simeon. And, um, and then it also uh, states, let it be known that Father Simeon um, is going to Jerusalem. Um, in the only instances where the inscriptions are identified with an individual, again, appear in 1793-1795, um, note, noted by the same hand. So, based on the, the size of the manuscript, which um, I mentioned maybe a little bit earlier, is about the, the size of a 4 by 6 larger note card, um, and also the, and it could fit in a cassock pocket, and also the, the explicit inscriptions, the reordering of the text, and the um, exclusion of certain liturgical services that one that would be of little use on a pilgrimage, um, and the inclusion of texts used for personal spiritual devotion, like an annual calendar, the commemoration of saints, feast days, services for the Holy Week of Easter, Bright Week, and so on, and a list for dietary and uh, uh, and other habits, all point to the probable use um, um, of a custom ordered prayer book um, used for pilgrimage or itinerant travel, um, and its production in the 16th century was basically later used in the 18th century um, to, to likely go to the Holy Lands by someone we know to be named Father Simeon in the 18th century. So these are the, the kind of fascinating conclusions that I've drawn from this. And that's just looking at the marginalia, um, at the, what we have left of this, but I believe this manuscript really can uh, be used in, in a variety of ways with scholars in the future that want to look at different features um, uh, of, the, of the manuscript. But basically, based on, its but based on its relative rarity in as a 16th century South Slav manuscript and the fact that it was unknown outside of the special collections at Spencer, um, the manuscript offers numerous possibilities, as I mentioned. And with scant secondary literature published on Orthodox religious life in the Ottoman Balkans um, and Orthodox pilgrimage from the late medieval period to the end of the 18th century, uh, future work with MSA 22 can offer scholars a new source uh, for beginning to fill the gap in understanding the life and religious practices um, of Orthodox clergy in the Balkans during 500 years of Ottoman rule.